Broadcast permission for the following program is made possible by the Columbia Broadcasting System. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to another tale of the macabre. By definition, macabre pertains to a dance in which death leads skeletons to the grave. But on a broader basis, consider this. In the course of one's life, each of us picks up a personal skeleton or two which alter our futures just as surely as wind in the desert forms new dunes. Mrs. Randall, a wealthy widow, has such a skeleton in her closet, and his name, so he claims, is Robert Lewis. Not that he goes now by that name. Not Robert Lewis. Anne? It is Anne, isn't it? I didn't quite catch your full name when we were introduced. Anne Hiller. And you're Nelson Potter. I had you pointed out to me. You didn't. I'm flattered, Mrs. Oh, no, you're not, Mr. Potter. Not really. You're new here in our sleepy little Hanover, and you're... Well, you're handsome and very striking. But why in the world you've singled me out? I, I, I don't know. It seemed obvious to me, and I was right. You have a look of intelligence in your eyes. And you're very attractive. Well, thank you. Any woman likes to hear that. Especially a... Middle-aged widow. But really, why? Our mystery drama, The Man Who Preyed on Widows, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Mason Adams and Russell Horton. I'll be back shortly with Act One. nothing unusual about a man who marries a widow, but a man who preys on them? And widows in their fifties and even older and with money have often been victimized. Their loneliness is a void which flattery and self-deception can fill. They are grateful for attention and confident that they are truly loved, which often simply isn't true. Sit down, Mr. Randall. Thank you, Lieutenant. We've located Robert Lewis. Oh, good work. Hard work. Mm, I'm grateful to you. And my mother will be, too, when she comes to her senses. I don't get it. She still feels the same way? I haven't seen her for two weeks, but I'll see her after I leave you. Last time I talked with her, there was no change. Mother may even think he'll still return. A professional bigamist? Yeah, I know, Lieutenant, I know. <laughs> Sometimes I think she's become senile. That's not true. Mrs. Randall is anything but... Mrs. Lewis... Mrs. Robert Lewis. Uh -oh. It's probably a phony name, too. No, 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 you're right. She's not senile. Just the opposite. Mother's intelligent and alert. But when I, when I talk to her about Lewis, she just smiles vaguely, tells me not to worry about him. It's infuriating. She said, it's only money, Lawrence. I have plenty of that. Yeah, but that's not the point. I know your mother's one of the richest women in Philadelphia and prominent. But this guy comes along and makes a fool of her. Of all of us. I'm embarrassed. My wife's tired of answering questions about Mother and Lewis. <laughs> you should hear my grandmother on the topic. Before Mother married Lewis, Grandmother urged her to see a psychiatrist. Oh, oh you're kidding. No, I'm not. <laughs> grandmother was, of course. She tried her best to ridicule Mother out of the marriage. Well, it didn't work. Nothing worked. She married him. He stayed around for over a year. And now he's been gone for two months. He's gone forever. You know that, and so do I. And I want him. We'll get him on a charge of bigamy. He makes a career of marrying rich women. Rips them off and skips. And they're embarrassed about pressing charges against him. He disappears, finds another victim, marries her, and the cycle goes on. Well, this time we'll get Mr. Lewis. And I agree with you. That's probably a phony name, too. Mm. Where is he, Lieutenant? 
You ready for this? <laughs> Nothing would surprise me. He's up in Hanover. Oh? Where Dartmouth College is? That's the place. He calls himself Nelson Potter. And he's got an eye on a widow named Ann Hiller. Uh -huh. Have you warned her? Uh, we will. Don't worry about her. Well, why not? I, I don't want to see another foolish widow taken advantage of. You. She won't be. I can promise you that. Well, are you going to let her marry the man just to get him on a charge of bigamy? Ann Hiller won't be hurt. I guarantee that. There's something you're not telling me, Lieutenant. The police have to work this out their own way, Mr. Randall. You want Robert Lewis arrested and exposed, I want him convicted and jailed. For bigamy? That's right. We know a lot about Lewis. He's been recognized through a photograph in Palm Beach and in Denver. Different names, of course, but the same guy. We could convict him on past charges, but the problem is to get the women he married to come forward and testify against him. They won't. Too embarrassed. We won't have that problem with Ann Hiller. Well, how can you be certain? We are. To your mother, he's Robert Lewis, and she's still married to him. To Ann Hiller, he's Nelson Potter. She'll marry him, and we'll pick him up. Mm -hmm. But what if my mother won't cooperate? No problem. We'll prove that the man deliberately married two women, and that will land him in the jug. Yeah, but what about the other women you say he married, the ones who are too embarrassed to come forward? If they married... They him, would they... deny it. Well, what about marriage licenses and ministers? We can't harass a woman into testifying against this guy when she doesn't want to. Even if one of them admitted marrying him, his name was X, Y, or Z, not Lewis or Potter. He's slippery. He counts on the feelings of the women for him. Incredible. <laughs> What's he got that we haven't got, Lieutenant? <laughs> oh, I wish I knew, Mr. Randall. I really wish I knew. You're looking well, Mother. Thank you. Would you like some tea? Uh, no, thank you. Sherry? No, no, not a thing, thanks. Oh, do sit down, Lawrence. Don't stand there like a prosecutor. Well, now, why would you say a thing like that? Now, let's not quarrel. You will admit that the few times you visited me in the past two months, you paced around the room and ranted gently about what a foolish old woman I've been. Mm -hmm. And you still can't see it. Oh, dear, can't we talk about something else? Robert Lewis is still my husband. You seem to forget that. Your husband was my late father, not the hypocrite you married a year ago. A crook who married you for your money, not because he cared for you. How do you know that? Mother, how can you ask such a foolish question? He came out of nowhere. He rolled his eyes at you. You fed your line of talk about he music and all. He was well informed, uh -huh. Lawrence. Books. He read a few books, homework, and fawned on you. It was outrageous. I want you to admit your mistake and help the police put Mr. Robert Lewis in jail. Why? Because he's a charlatan who preys on rich widows, a hypocrite. An amoral opportunist. Have you ever asked yourself if some rich widows want to be preyed upon? You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. But that's stupid. You're not stupid, Mother. How nice of you to say so. <sighs> I really don't understand you. Well, then why bother about it? Haven't you anything else to talk about? I'm harmless. I don't think I committed a heinous crime in remarrying. For over a year, he lived here like a crown prince on the money you squandered on him. A fortune, I'm sure. I don't resent it. Why should you? Because you're my mother. And Lewis made a fool out of you. You may not know it, but there's a lot of gossip about you and Lewis. And, well, it's made Nancy and me very, very uncomfortable. We ignore it, but all the same, it's there. Yes, I suppose it is. I do regret that. I know how sensitive Nancy is to gossip. Apologize to her for me and suggest that if the subject comes up again in her presence, to tell the scandalmonger to telephone me. Either that or have her say that I am none of her business. But you are our business. I'm your son. Yes, yes, I know that, Lawrence. And may I suggest that you follow that same advice? Consider you none of my business? <sighs> That's absurd. Oh, dear, how unmodern you are, Lawrence. Isn't this the era of the emancipated woman? Can't I do as I please? Must I consult my son and daughter-in-law about every decision? Well, but if you'd only listen to us and to your friends... I you... did listen. 
And you talk twaddle. You're an old foolish widow going on 60. He wants your money. You're lonely. He knows that and is going to take advantage of it. People would laugh at you. He'll rob you blind and skedaddle. Well? All true. Of course. Don't you think I knew all that? You said I wasn't stupid, Lawrence. You're not, but you behave stupidly. Everything you said was true. Robert Lewis knew that father left you a fortune. He planned to marry you. He did. I couldn't prevent it, and then he left you. So he did. Mm -hmm. To marry another foolish widow with a lot of money. Well, that's news at last. Has he married again? Yeah, he's about to. Robert Lewis now calls himself Nelson Potter. He's after a woman named Ann Hiller. Bigamy. He's a bigamist, Mother. And I am going to see that he's arrested and sentenced to jail. He wouldn't like that, Lawrence. Well, how can you be so... so indifferent about it? Have you lost all sense of judgment? Values change. You really don't care what Nancy and I think of this. This... this... this farce you've made out of your life. Well, I really can't say that I do, Lawrence. If you were as wise as I am old, and if you had even the tiniest sense of humor, you'd smile with your mother about her... her rascal. Her rascal, her rascal. Her scoundrel is more like it. No. A scoundrel is a villain. And Robert Lewis never was a villain to me. <laughs> Lieutenant Eccles speaking. Oh, hello. I see. Day after tomorrow. Have the necessary papers been... Good. So Lewis as Potter has captured the heart of the widow Hiller. <laughs> I want to meet this guy. He's got something most of us must be lacking. They tell me, what's the weather like up in Hanover? That cold, eh? Well, Mr. Randall and I will bundle up and be on hand for the ceremony. Now, you know what to do. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Beats me. Lieutenant, I got your message. I left the office as soon as I could. He's marrying her day after tomorrow. Can you make a trip with me to Hanover? Of course. Fine. Then we'll have Lewis or Potter or whatever his name is in jail before the week is out. Uh, that's where he belongs. Hmm. I still don't like what's happening to Mrs. Hiller. Uh, why can't we just interrupt the ceremony? No, no, I want him to marry her. Then we've got him. Well, it seems unfair to her, a dirty trick. I, I, I really don't like it, Lieutenant. Don't worry about it. Believe me, Mrs. Hiller won't be hurt. Mm, she's fallen for the She'll bomb. She'll recover. You know something that's puzzled me, Lieutenant... How does this guy work this marrying game? Now, why did he pick Hanover, of all places? And how did he get to meet a rich widow who was ripe to get married? Good questions. We wondered the same thing. I can't answer why he went to Hanover. It's small, and from what the police there have told us, it's kind of an intimate, democratic place. A stranger in town, especially a good-looking guy like Lewis with a sports car and well-heeled, wouldn't have much trouble getting acquainted how he got acquainted with Mrs. Hiller, that's easy. He went to a real estate broker and asked to see some houses. Mrs. Hiller's house had just come on the market. Lewis saw the house and struck up an acquaintance with her. That simple. I see. Lewis uses real estate agents the way insurance men watch engagement notices and births. That's right. Lewis gets the real estate guy to talk, then does the rest. Be ready to leave tomorrow and bring warm clothes. It's zero up in Hanover. I still don't feel right about Mrs. Hiller. We do, Mr. Randall. All I can tell you is that the police are protecting her. And she knows it. And there you have it. Robert Lewis, alias this, alias that, seems to have made a career of preying on rich widows. A widow and her money can be parted by an unscrupulous man. He takes advantage of the emptiness she feels when family and friends have departed and, like Mrs. Randall, finds herself alone in a house in which only memories remain. Mrs. Randall, however, seems to be an exception. What about Mrs. Hiller? 
We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Over 300 years ago, George Herbert wrote, Marry a widow before she leaves mourning. Cynical, isn't it? But it is more often true than not. Death creates a void. For the first time since she married, as a matter of fact, for the first time since she was born, a woman finds herself alone. There are men who are opportunists, eager to fill that void. And Robert Lewis, now Nelson Potter, is that kind of predator. Marrying rich widows is, in fact, his unusual and despicable career. My darling Anne, how lovely you look. May I kiss you? If you care to. Care to. I love you. Mm. Uh, that's pretty convincing, Nelson. Is anything the matter, Anne? I know. I know. You're having second thoughts. Is that it? Well... Darling, darling, we'll wait. A week, a month. I've been thoughtless as usual. Oh, you've never been that, Nelson. Thoughtless. Oh, yes, I have. I come out of nowhere into Hanover. I meet you, I rush you off your feet and propose. You don't know much about me except how I feel about you. Who am I? Why am I here? Am I rich or poor, kind or cruel? Oh, Nelson, please. No, 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 no. I'm serious, Anne, really. If I were you, I'd think twice, too. Oh, it embarrasses me to hear you talk that way. Darling, you have to be sure. Now, I know how I feel about you. I love you. I think you do. Why? I cannot say. Look at me. I have. Many, many times. You're handsome. Oh, perhaps. In a middle-aged way. I'm in my late fifties. Youth is far behind me. Let's not kid ourselves. With your good looks, women 20 years younger than you are everywhere, waiting to become your wife. Why me? May I tell you something? What can you possibly see in me a a as a woman? Darling, listen. He that loves a rosy cheek or a coral lip admires... But, Nelson, my cheeks aren't rosy, and my coral lips come from a stick. Please, let me finish. It's the second verse I had in mind when I wrote the poem for you. Time does dull the rosy cheek and the coral lip, but a smooth and steadfast mind, gentle thoughts and calm desires, hearts with equal love combined, kindle never dying fires. Where these are not, I despise lovely cheeks or lips or eyes. Oh, that's beautiful. And you wrote that? For you. It says better than I love you how I feel about Anne Hiller. Oh, my goodness. I've never had a poem written to me. I have something else for you, Anne. Yes? Whether you marry me or not, it's yours. This. <gasps> from me to you, my darling. Oh, Nelson, a ring. Is, is that an, an emerald? Yes, quite a fine one. Oh, good heavens, it must have cost a fortune. That didn't cost me anything. It's filled with memories. Because it was my mother's. Oh. She left it to me with the hope that someday I'd meet the woman who would wear it with grace and in pride. You, Anne. Oh, it's beautiful. I hope you'll wear it. Put it on. It's yours without a commitment. I'll never meet another woman I'd ever give it to. Oh, well, I... I, I, I don't know what to say. It, it was just beautiful. It came to my mother from her mother. I don't know how old it is, but it's been in the Potter family for many years. Oh, it's extraordinary. Mother died two years ago. Oh. She was quite well to do. I'm an only son. She, she, she died a widow? Yes. Oh, maybe that explains your interest in a lonely woman like me. Not at all. From the first time I met you just two months ago, I've been drawn to you by your loveliness and intelligence. I was astonished to learn that you're a widow. It was my good fortune that you were still free. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. I don't talk like an old maid, Anne. I'm sorry. But you, you must have thought about your mother all the years she was alone and, and well-to-do. Oh, of course they are lonely, and they can be exploited. But of course, you wonder, 
If I'm a fortune hunter. Oh, not really. But I have been proposed to before. Not everyone up here is a stick. There, there was a young ski instructor. I don't who, doubt it. And uh, he was just after your money. Is that right? Uh, of well, course. Well, how can I put it? Either you believe me or you don't. When I say that I love you for you and only you yourself, that's all that I can offer. I have a small income from my mother's estate. My poetry pays practically nothing. So if you marry me, Anne, life won't be luxurious. Oh, nonsense. What about my money? I won't touch it. Of course you will. Money's a commodity to be enjoyed and will enjoy it. Oh, I'm very well fixed with this fine old estate and sound securities, and there's a considerable amount of cash in the bank. Why, there's more than enough to provide us with a very comfortable life. Come in, Lawrence. Thank you, Mother. Well, twice in one week. What does your Nancy say about that? Why should she say anything? Because in her eyes, I am a pariah. You know that. A difference of opinion isn't going to keep me from seeing well, you. Well, I'm glad to hear that. But I wasn't certain. It's nothing against you, Mother. Both Nancy and I feel very strongly about Robert Lewis, and... Well, I'm going to do something about it. That's why I stopped by. Oh? You may make a fool of yourself, Lawrence. Not a greater fool than I already feel I am. Lawrence, let me appeal to you once more. Robert Lewis is everything you say he is. An opportunist who most certainly married me for my money. He enjoyed it for a year. Left with some seven or eight thousand dollars, and surely will not return. Goodbye, Robert Lewis. The end. No, not the end. Think of the humiliation. Oh, don't be childish, Lawrence. Humiliation, oh. my big toe. I'm your mother. I'm also a woman. Now, during the nearly two years I was married to Robert, I felt alive for the first time since your father died. He was charming to me, attentive, considerate. He made me feel like a woman again. It was a pose. I know that. I'm not stupid. I know my money bought his love and companionship. And you see nothing wrong in that. Well, not really. I bought something I wanted. I knew it was slightly unreal. The idea, the idea of buying a... I enjoyed being married to Robert Lewis. I expected him to pack up and leave. He has. No regrets. Mm -hmm. Not even about the emerald ring? The... Well, that was rather a low blow. I, I wish you hadn't mentioned it, Lawrence. That's because you're still living a fantasy. Well, the rest of us see Mr. Lewis in a different light. I came over to tell you I'll be out of town for a day or two. Lieutenant Eccles and I are flying to White River Junction, then driving to Hanover. Oh? Oh, you did mention the other day that Robert Lewis is now Nelson Potter, is that right? That's right. And that he's engaged to marry an Anne something or other? That's right. And you and this policeman propose to march into the church and cry, Halt the wedding? No, no, I, I don't know what the plan is. Oh, what right have you to prevent the marriage? The best right in the world. Oh. Robert Lewis is already married to you. If he marries again, he's a bigamist. And when he married you, he also committed bigamy. He belongs in jail. Tell your militant lieutenant not to involve me in your harassment because I don't intend to press charges against Robert Lewis. Not even for the recovery of the emerald ring? Well, I... I would like that returned, I must admit. It belongs to the family. Yes. Yes, I'd like to have it back. glad I found you in, Lieutenant. It just came from my mother's. So. Oh? Yeah, I told her I'd be out of town for a few days and the reason why. No reason not to. Unless, uh... Well, is it possible your mother might try to get in touch with Lewis? Ooh. I never thought of that. Neither had I. But if your mother is still soft in the head, you'll excuse me for saying so. But if she is, if she doesn't want to see him hurt, who knows? She just might warn him we're about to close in. I can't believe that, Lieutenant. But then, uh, why not? She is soft in the head about all of it. She 
She admits Robert Lewis ripped her off. She doesn't care. She said she had a wonderful time with him the year and a half they were married. She paid for it, and she doesn't care that he left her. <laughs> In fact, she expected him to. Can you explain it? Beats me. Mother doesn't care that Lewis is marrying Ann Hiller. She said even if we catch him as a bigamist, she won't press charges against him. The only regret she has is that he stole an emerald ring, an heirloom, when he copped out. Well, well, well. What's that supposed to mean? <laughs> Guess who's wearing it now? You can't mean it. Oh, but I do. Ann Hiller. It's her engagement ring. He said it was left to him by his mother. L Lieutenant, how do you know all these things? You, you say Mrs. Hiller won't be heard. If, if she marries this con man, of course she'll be heard. Now you tell me he's given her my mother's ring. How, how do you know that? I know something more. Let's have it. He's a poet. Well, you mean he's pretending to be a poet? No. When he proposed to her, he used one of his poems to get her to say, okay, she'd marry him. Listen to this. He that loves a rosy cheek or a coral lip admires... Now, now, hold it. That's a 17th century trochaic four-foot meter. He says he wrote that? Sure. Well, what do you mean, uh, troke, whatever you said it was? Well, uh, read some more. Well, he said he didn't care about the rosy cheek or coral lip bit. But a smooth and steadfast mind, gentle thoughts and calm desires, hearts with equal love combined, kindle never-dying fires. Where these are not, I despise lovely cheeks or lips or eyes. And he said he wrote that poetry? Sure, it's all down on the tape. Oh, so that's how you know so much. You've wired Mrs. Hiller's house. That's right. Just the sitting room. We figured that's where he'd make his pitch. Yeah. And that's where you got your information about the emerald ring? Right on the tape. I tell you, this guy has quite a line. And Mrs. Hiller said yes? The wedding goes on as planned at the home of a justice of the peace. And that's where we cause an interruption? After they're spliced. Is Mrs. Hiller cooperating with you in all this, Lieutenant? Well, let's say we've uh, alerted her that uh, Mr. Potter may not be all he says he is. I want this wedding to go through. I'll pick you up in the squad car tomorrow morning about nine, and don't forget the warm clothing. All right. It's a funny situation. It's different going after a mugger or somebody who committed murder. We know what we're after. But here, we're allowing the guy to frame himself. We know he's committed the same crime before, bigamy. But it's got to be proved. It's like trying to get your hands on a shadow. Yeah. Mm. Well, see you at nine in the morning. I feel sorry about Mrs. Hiller. I really do. She's fallen for the guy. Well, he's he's got to break her heart. <laughs> Wait until you meet the widow, Hiller. You're in for a surprise. <laughs> An unusual situation, you'll admit. Bigamy is a crime, no question about it. But unlike a robbery or a murder, where the person robbed or the family comes forward to the police, the victims of bigamy do not always file protests. Why? Well, there's a matter of embarrassment. What woman is willing to admit she's been made a fool of? More about the subject when I return shortly with Act Three. It's not often that a married man consummates another marriage. When he has, it's usually been because he would be unable to obtain a divorce. All the same, there have been men with second families. But Robert Lewis, now known as Nelson Potter, is a different breed of cat. He preys on widows, rich widows, exploits them for pleasure and money, and then vanishes. He's made a career of preying on widows. Now, with the help of the police, the son of one of Lewis's victims hopes to bring that career to an end. Now, Mr. Potter, uh, please be seated. Thank you, Judge. The lady said yes. Did she? Well, you're a lucky young man. Congratulations. Thank you. She's a marvelous woman. Uh, now that I've heard your good news, I expect you've got a date for me to perform the service. Tomorrow afternoon at four. Oh, it's fine. Uh, 
I'll open a bottle of champagne I reserve for occasions like this. This check will cover a gratuity to you and several bottles of champagne. One hundred dollars? What? My goodness, that's very generous of, uh, of, uh... Uh, both of you. I, I see it's made out by Mrs. Hiller. Yes, she insisted. Uh, well, uh, she has it to spend. Yeah, yeah, and Hiller's a wealthy woman. But like all good New Hampshire persons, frugal. Uh, this is much more than I'd expected. I, I, I thank you, sir, sincerely. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. There's one other thing that you could do for me, Judge. Oh, yeah, yes. Well, what is that? I uh, don't want to drag somebody off the street to act as a witness. Oh, well, my wife will be one. Uh, she likes champagne. <laughs> as for the other, now leave that to me. A friend of mine named Eccles will be only too glad to stand up for you. Thank you. I haven't lived in Hanover very long, so well, I don't... I understand uh, Life's odd, isn't it? Eh, you well, know, it's a, eh, not a, an original statement, but it's a true one. <laughs> what I mean is, you dropped out of nowhere and right into the arms and affections of Anne Hiller. Hmm. Perhaps destiny does shape our ends. Uh, uh, by the way, if it's not impertinent, uh, where did you drop in from, Mr. Potter? Florida. My mother lived in Palm Beach. She died a few years ago, and I've drifted around since then. Uh, well, it's been uh, pleasant talking with you. Uh, thank you for this generous check, and I'll see you and the bride-to-be at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you, Judge. No, no, don't bother to show me to the door. I'll let myself out. Goodbye. Goodbye. All right, Sergeant. You can turn the recorder off. Oh, darling. My lovely Anne. It's all set. Oh, I'm shaking all over, Nelson. Ah, no, no, no. Oh, isn't that foolish? A middle-aged woman about to marry again and... I've got the jitters. Relax. The J.P.'s a nice old bird. The check knocked him over. He'll have champagne for us, and he's taking care of a best man for me, someone named Eccles. Oh, how nice of him. Service is at 4. By 4.30, we'll be on our way. Oh, you, you picked up the airline ticket? Right. White River Junction to Boston, and then nonstop to Nassau and the warm Caribbean. Uh, Beautiful sand, moonlit nights, dancing, everything. I want this to be the happiest time of your life. Oh, it will be. There's only one thing wrong. Oh? I don't like sponging off you, Anne. You paid for the tickets in advance. You're paying for the entire honeymoon. Oh, why not? I've got the money. Yes, but I'm not destitute. This should have been my expense. Oh, don't be foolish. After tomorrow afternoon, what's mine is yours. How else can this be a marriage of equals? In fact, darling, I've already transferred a substantial amount of money to an account at the bank in your name. Now, what do you think of that? I can't get over you, my sweet Anne. I really can't. It's one surprise after another. And there are others in store for you. I mean, did, did you know I am an expert swimmer? I'll show you a thing or two in Nassau. You do swim, don't you, darling? Oh, sure. Not very well. I'm no expert. Oh, you're not? And you come from Palm Beach? I thought everyone from Florida swam like a fish. Palm Beach? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, but I, I wasn't born in Palm Beach. My hometown is a little place in Indiana. We uh, had a, a farm. Oh, yes. When father died, my mother moved south. I was, oh, in my mid-twenties, and I moved there with her. I worked in a bank. Oh, I can swim. But not like a native Floridian. Then I'll teach you. Now, darling, take me in your arms and tell me you love me. It's beautiful, Lieutenant. Yeah, nice view. Mm, this is a wonderful old inn. The sun setting against those old Dartmouth buildings, the snow in front of us. Why, it's a picture postcard, just lovely. And cold. Must be zero out there. Yeah, and out there somewhere, poor Mrs. Hiller's about to become the next sacrificial lamb. I wish you'd stop that, Mr. Randall. Mrs. Hiller is no such thing. She knows that. There's something very fishy about all this, Lieutenant. I've said that before. You'll know everything soon enough. Excuse me. Uh, the, the police? We'll see. Lieutenant Eccles? Yes? Sergeant Morrissey. 
Justice of the Peace, Morrissey? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, come on in. Glad to meet you. We can't thank you enough for your cooperation. Glad to be of help. Meet Mr. Lawrence Randall. His mother is married to the bum. Oh, how do you do? A pleasure. Mr. Randall, this is the man who is performing the service tomorrow. Oh, but uh, how can Sergeant Morrissey be a justice of the peace? He's retired and he received an appointment. He's licensed to perform the service. Oh, even though he knows this man is already married? He knows that from us, not of himself. As far as I'm concerned, Anne Hiller and Nelson Potter will be married by me tomorrow at four o'clock. The lieutenant here will decide what happens then. Oh, and uh, by the way, Lieutenant, uh, you're going to be his best man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that's great. <laughs> uh, does this man know what he's doing to that innocent widow? Look, Mr. Randall, for the last time, this problem's being handled by the police. We don't want any interference. Sergeant, I'll be at your house tomorrow before four. The equipment is working? Works just fine. Uh, good night. Oh, uh, I almost forgot. Uh, that poem uh, this bum said he wrote. He that loves a rosy cheek, that one? Yeah, I, I checked it with a young English teacher at the college. Took him a few minutes. Uh, then he found it. Some English character named Thomas Carew. Yeah. Can you imagine Potter trying to pass it off as his own in a community like this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, see you tomorrow. Okay, good night. Thomas Carew. Mr. Lewis is a very, very slick character. Tell you what, you'd like to get some dinner and so would I. I hear there's a good restaurant about 15 minutes north in Lyme. Keep your collar up and your hat pulled down when we walk through the hotel lobby and we'll risk having dinner up there. So, by the authority vested in me by the state of New Hampshire, I now pronounce you ma'am and wife. You may uh, kiss the bride, Mr. Potter. Will I ever? Mm. Oh, Nelson, my darling. Congratulations to both of you. Mr. Eccles, thank you for standing up for me. It was a pleasure, Mr. Lewis. Lu Lewis. Nelson Potter. No, I don't think so, Mr. Lewis. Well, now, no, no, see here, Eccles, just what is this? Uh... Judge, unless I'm badly mistaken, this man who says he's Nelson Potter is Robert Lewis. And he's already married to a woman who lives just outside Philadelphia. Nelson! That's not true. Judge, who is this man? I'm Lieutenant Eccles of the Philadelphia Police Department. Nelson! We're getting out of here, Ann. I don't know what kind of a trick this guy's trying to pull, but you're my wife and we'll fight this crazy accusation. With every cent she's got. Right, Lewis? How dare you pull a stunt like this? It's no stunt, Lewis. Potter! Nelson Potter! Hogwash. Come in, Mr. Randall. Nelson! Shut up. What? Hello, Mr. Lewis. You. Quite right. You married my mother over a year ago and disappeared about two months ago. You're a bigamist, Lewis. How many times, I don't know. But this time you've been caught. Sergeant Morrissey here... The justice of the peace is a... Sergeant Morrissey? That's correct, uh... I'll finish what the lieutenant was about to request. Sir, I'm placing you under arrest. You'll never keep me in jail. Mrs. Randall won't press charges against me, and neither will Ann. I love Ann. I've never really loved another woman. You may arrest me, but you'll never hold me. I know Ann loves me, don't you, darling? No. What? You see, Nelson, two can play your game. We set a trap for you, and you got caught. What are you talking about? I'm Nelson Potter, and you're Ann Hiller, and we're married. You're my wife, and we're going to Nassau for our honeymoon. Sorry, Nelson. The marriage is null and void because you're already married. You sound so different. Not kind, not warm, but hard, harsh. In the line of duty, I can be many kinds of person. I don't understand. I am a policewoman. <laughs> Wonderful job, Mrs. Hilly. Thank you, Lieutenant. This uh, young man, Randall, uh, he's been worrying about us allowing you to be hoodwinked. <laughs> well, I didn't tell you everything, Randall, because you just might have told your mother about it. You mentioned the name of Ann Hiller, and your mother called her last night. No. Yes. She was most sympathetic. 
She told me to marry the bum, that he was charming and devoted. <laughs> Mother really is senile. No, she's not. I understand. She was lonely. But he didn't love her. He pretended to, and he did a good job. Oh, he could charm a bird off a branch. I really liked him. You don't mean that. Oh, but I do. He made me feel like a woman. Well, you can say that in this day of emancipated woman. <laughs> Emancipation is just a matter of degree. Uh, it beats me. How about you, Lieutenant? <laughs> no comment. I'm a married man. I guess what Lewis has that we haven't got is a bedside manner. <laughs> you have a hard time practicing it in the jug. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I'm really glad to get this ring back. Mrs. Hiller took it off her finger and gave it to me. Give it... Give it to Nancy. This emerald ring has been passed on to the women in this family from generation to generation. It should belong to her. Well, thank you, Mother. So Robert Lewis is in jail. That's right. He'll be out of circulation for a long time. Oh, it seems such a mean trick. I don't regret having married him. You'll never understand that, will you? Mother, he's been abusing widows for years. Has he indeed? I wonder if they feel that way about him. Hmm. Oh, one other thing. May I speak to lawyers about annulling your marriage? Why not? Robert won't return to me. He has too much pride. And if my marriage to him is annulled, your stuffy sense of what's right and proper will be satisfied. Yes, yes, go ahead with the lawyers. And when the papers come through, perhaps Nancy will come to call on me with my grandchildren. <laughs> Robert Lewis, Nelson Potter, and alias many other names, a man without a sense of moral responsibility. But if you believed Mrs. Randall, and even that policewoman, Ann Hiller, a man with enough charm to compensate for what you and I, I hope, would find to be a defect in his nature. It seems obvious that such a rascal, Mrs. Randall's word, should not be allowed to prey on rich and lonely widows, but she didn't seem to mind. I'll return shortly. The Defenseless Widow, an interesting study. It's hard to play doubles in tennis without a partner, it's hard to say good night after an evening of bridge and return to an empty house and a meal to prepare just for yourself. This is loneliness. A void to be filled. Sometimes it is, happily. Sometimes, as we have heard, a man will exploit that loneliness. Perhaps companionship is worth the cost. Our cast included Mason Adams, Joan Shea, Russell Horton, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The preceding program was broadcast with the permission of the Columbia Broadcasting System.